So I, I was thinking when I got back that I really wanted to do an episode around uh, poutine because it's a um, it, it's a liquid that uh, people in the U.S. probably don't know about. Some of the worldwide audience may not know about it, and it's got a long legacy. Um, there are only a handful of distilleries in Ireland that are making it right now, uh, and right. I was really struck with the quality of what you guys were making there. And, and so, and and not only that, but the family legacy behind it. Uh, and so, I thought, who better to have on the show uh, for to talk about uh, not only poutine, but also talk about uh, the whiskey that you're making and about the brand Mickel and the rest. There's a lot of history. Galway hasn't had distilling for a long time, so I want to jump into all of that stuff. If you've got, uh, if you're ready and raring to go. I am uh, ready and raring to go, and uh, look, there's a tremendous history there, uh, both of uh, putting making, whiskey making, and uh, you know, huge amount of depth to that story, and of course, uh, a great depth to the story of Mikkel as well. Yeah. So, how many generations are we talking about in your family? Um, so, we're the sixth generation of distillers. Uh, so, my brother and I are both uh, sixth generation distillers. Uh, my brother is actually the head distiller here at Mikkel Distillery. Um, but we learned directly from our grandfather, our late grandfather, Jimmy, and uh, he would have been with us there until 2020, and uh, he got a good long age of uh, 93 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was really, um, uh, how to put it, uh, great for him to see uh, the first generation doing putting legally, because a lot of people don't realize that uh, putting was illegal in Ireland up until 1997. But uh, we, we can get into the reasons why it actually became illicit in the first place and it's uh, normally not what people were thinking people have misconceptions around how it's made uh what it's you know what it's made from and why it became illegal so we can we can jump into all of that and um one other key thing i think that a lot of people don't realize or aren't aware of and i mean this collectively i don't mean just irish people or or, or people from elsewhere but um a lot of them don't see that poutine and whiskey were the same spirit historically and the only thing that separated them really was the ownership of a license. And mm. I think the word that uh, encapsulates both of them is the Irish language word, uh, which is called fushke. And we'll get to fushke later again as well and the etymology of that and how it relates to a more modern word that we're very, very familiar with. Okay. And for people who have heard in Scotland and in the U.S., we refer to... Uh, the illegal, illicit uh, spirit as being moonshine. It, would it be a fair assessment to say that uh, poutine is really the Irish moonshine? Um, it's, uh, it's a pretty good uh, sort of, how would I put it, encapsulation of it. Uh, but just to give people a bit of background, uh, the earliest written record we have of aquavitae making here in Ireland, which is Latin for water of life, uh, is 1324 and that's in the Red Book of Osri and it's not to suggest that we don't have uh, traditions that are older it's just we have a some uh, reference that gives us uh, you know a very uh, precise date and we'll work on, on the basis that that is our earliest record it is at the moment and um, this is when poutine began or indeed what we now know today as whiskey and uh, the tradition developed and uh, by the 17th century uh, it had uh, become huge in Ireland, making your own spirit at home. And then tax was introduced in 1661. And then we decided, because we were still under British rule, uh, kind of like yourselves historically, we decided not to pay the taxes and rather to start hiding our stills. And uh, this echoes and mirrors what uh, would have happened in the US as well uh, when taxes were first introduced on uh, distilled liquor. And um, Irish and Scottish distillers, I mean, we, we know that uh, there's a huge um, tradition in the US uh, that we had a huge amount of uh, immigration. And many of these immigrants, you know, came from all over, you know, the world, uh, Ireland, Scotland, Europe, etc. And, um, you know, the Irish and Scottish distillers, one of the, the great legacies that they brought was uh, distilling. And they also wanted to avoid local taxes. So they continued this at nighttime tradition uh, in efforts to avoid tax and the authorities and of course because of the time of day it was made 
it was known as Moonshine. And uh, so that would be the link between Putin and, and uh, Moonshine. It's remarkable looking at the uh, old Putin stills and comparing them to some of the old Moonshine stills the resemblance and uh, you know it, it's it's uh, it's really incredible the the other thing i'd say is that just so that people are aware of the etymology of putin um so it comes from the irish language and uh, a small pot in irish is called uh putin and just a basic pot is known as putta so basically that's what it means uh, something made in a small pot still yeah so and as i traveled around most people were pronouncing it as pochin uh, or you would hear it as Pochin, or I, I, I heard all sorts of different variations on it. But you, you actually uh, put kind of a T sound on it instead of a CH sound. So, and, and this is something I found, and maybe this you can speak to this. Uh, in Scotch, we, you know, there are some, um, there are those names that go back to the the Gaelic tradition. And but they all seem to have the same pronunciation. But around Ireland, there seems to be a lot of dialects, different variations. And so is that kind of like maybe a Connemara um, translation of that uh, pronunciation or, or how would you assess that? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great kind of a question. So um, in the Irish language, um, you know, we have and by the way, just to give people a bit of insight here as well. Uh, 200 to 500 AD, uh, the Gaelic or Celtic culture uh, essentially was um, throughout Ireland. Uh, that that was sort of uh, the, the the Celtic culture, and of course uh, the uh, Irish language. This is Old Irish, and at that point, uh, both uh, the island of Ireland and uh, Scotland spoke the same language. Okay, and then of course uh, through uh, for various reasons that we wouldn't have time to go into all today, uh, <laughs> but basically uh, mostly to do with the colonization of of Ireland and and indeed uh, Scotland, there is an evolution then of uh, those languages. So they are still from the same roots, but can we communicate freely with each other now? Uh, no, but we would pick up uh, very specific words. Now, in terms of the pronunciation of Putin, if we all acknowledge, and it's uh, it's uh, it doesn't need even need acknowledgement, it is an Irish language word. Uh, the most authentic way to pronounce it is in that language, and and uh, the T would be a slender T, as I would call it, as a as a former Irish uh, teacher and, and tutor. Um, but um, throughout the country, there are various dialects. So Ulster has its own dialect, and that even varies within Ulster. Connacht has its own dialect. Munster. Leinster, etc. And even within those provinces, there's a great degree of difference uh, between dialects. So you can actually tell, certainly historically, you know, and, and uh, maybe perhaps with the older demographic, because they weren't as affected by globalization and social media, etc. You can actually pinpoint more precisely where they grew up. So I have, often have interesting conversations with people that I meet, and I, I love to try and guess where they're from, you know, mm. based on their on their dialect. Anyway, uh, this is a very long-winded way of uh, explaining the pronunciation of Putin, but the T would be slender. So let's take Ulster in the Irish language. They would say Patin. Uh, you go to Galway or Connemara then, or and indeed wider Connacht, and uh, it would be mostly called Putin for us. And then if you go to Munster, they would emphasize the latter syllable like they do with many of their words. And to them, it's Putin where they would emphasize the, the latter part of it. And, and uh, the, the pieces of Leinster that still have a bit of Irish language being spoken would very much be either Connacht version or the Munster version. Okay. And so this... Well, well, Putin or Patin is still okay. It just, it's the anglicized form. Okay. All right. That works. And while we're talking about uh, linguistics and anglicized forms maybe this is a good time to jump into the uh other piece that you were talking about which is about the other spirit that yeah. uh has evolved out of that early tradition yeah so giving credit where credit is due i mean distilling originally came from the middle east uh, for making uh, perfumes and essential oils the europeans uh, ruined it or perfected it by then adding wine to these herbs flowers and spices and then uh, later this tradition came to Ireland and uh, it was brought by monks who would have been traveling back and forth between Ireland and, and, and Europe and they uh, translated this aquavitae you know water of life spirit into the Irish language which became known as Ishke Baha 
which is a very good translation, by the way. It, it still means water of life. And then Ishkebaha, uh, which is two words, became one word. It became Fushke. And uh, again, kind of like yourselves, uh, we were colonized and Irish language words were um, anglicized. So, for instance, uh, to make uh, Fushke more easy to pronounce in the English language, a W was added after the F and uh, even a K was also added. Now, remove the F. You've now got Wishke eventually fully anglicized. It becomes whiskey. So that's, in fact, where whiskey comes from. Okay. And so now that we have uh, whiskey and we have uh, poutine, we have the two splitting apart, and you have whiskey distillers who are legal who apparently were having some trouble with the taxes that the taxes were really eating into their profits so they started really overproducing to try to beat the tax and i had heard that they were actually that uh Pacin actually got a better reputation over time than the whiskey that was being made because they were doing techniques like uh it would that these stills would foam up and so they would use like car carabolic soap to um, try to reduce that that foam on it. Um, and so was that was that the way it was? As far as we know, that uh, really there was a point where poutine was just much more desirable than whiskey at that point. So yes, uh, poutine was more desirable uh, through specific periods of history. Um, I think one of the turning points in whiskey, which we'll get to in a moment, would have been 1823. But, you know, throughout the sort of uh, 17th and 18th centuries, uh, early whiskey in Ireland uh, had a struggle. And one of its big struggles was this, uh, the, the, you know, the, how do you find a balance between taxation and actually creating good spirit? And as you referred to, they were uh, trying to sort of keep up with the tax, as in producing more. Uh, and this was based on the way they were taxed. They were taxed on the out. Sorry, they were based on they were taxed based on the size of their operations rather than their actual outputs. And this was an attempt by the authorities to keep the distilleries honest. Uh, but this kind of backfired on them because the quality of spirit that they were producing uh, was poor. And then as a result, uh, they sold less of it. So of course, people turned to the superior quality spirit, which was not made under time constraints, which was following the more traditional. Uh, methodologies, uh, which was poutine. Interestingly as well, these uh, whiskey distilleries, as you said, uh, they were experiencing foaming and they were using stuff, like you said, like carbolic soap. Uh, they also would have uh, made their pots shallower so that they could run uh, the spirit through quicker. So it, it, uh, basically they would boil up quicker. But look, as we know, making whiskey should not be, um, you know, done quickly, you know, and, and if you rush it, uh, you'll create a coarse spirit. So it was not the right way to go. But uh, anyway, I think in 1823, it was probably a sign that uh, the mindset by the tax authorities was changing. And uh, the likes of uh, this famous character called Anius Coffey uh, would have certainly informed uh, the... Uh, Anius Coffey, by the way, was uh, probably the best-known tax collector in Irish whiskey history <laughs> that I'm aware of, at least. And uh, he was a trusted advisor to government because he was on their side as a tax collector. But also he had this very deep understanding of the way distilleries worked. Uh, and later, in fact, he invented a new still called the coffee still named after himself. But before we get to that, I guess, he um, was uh, you know, quite influential in the shift in mindset. And one of the big shifts was the time. Uh, of payment of tax. So up until 1823, distilleries were obliged to pay the tax on spirit as soon as it came off their stills. After this year, they were permitted to pay the tax on the whiskey coming out of the cask. Mm. And of course, this was to encourage leaving it in the cask. And once they discovered that this encouragement and, and uh, sort of incentive worked, it later became legislation and, and a legal requirement that whiskey would have to be aged in a wooden cask for X amount of time, which today is three years. So it's interesting that, uh, because I read this not too long ago, that his original intention with that still was probably more towards uh, in a uh, more industrial use rather than actually as something to drink. Uh, but that uh, dis these distillers, 
uh, kind of took it upon themselves to say, oh, look, we can make this uh, we can make this stuff really fast with this. Why don't we just just roll with that? Have you heard that same story? Um, I, I actually uh, haven't in that sense, but I do know that the Scottish uh, would have um, been certainly more open to this technology. And, uh, and, and there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, a, um, we'll say we would have had 60% of global market share in whiskey up until the early 20th century here in Ireland. Um, so global leaders in whiskey production. So there was this, uh, I would say, almost snobbery or almost pride, either or, whichever you want to look at it. But there was a reluctance to do anything apart from what was done traditionally. And I guess when you're in that, you know, sort of fortunate position that, you know, hey, we're making the best whiskey in the world or we are the global leaders in terms of sales. Why would you consider even changing it? <laughs> so I think that lack of openness was actually detrimental. Now, there was a lot of other factors, uh, you know, in, in, the, in, in why Irish whiskey uh, declined so uh, dramatically in the 20th century. Um, and as you all know, I'm sure that we, we did, uh, you know, uh, uh, leave the United Kingdom and uh, that it meant we were no longer, uh, what do you call it, uh, we were no longer, uh, had, we no longer had uh, trade agreements with uh, countries. So all of that stuff was unraveled and we had to start from, from basically from square one and uh, all those things had to be built up again, the, uh, the, the agreements from a trade perspective. And, and of course, prohibition was hugely detrimental as well to us uh, because uh, the U.S. market was one of our best markets. Yeah. Well, I had also heard that uh, Joe Kennedy had actually come to the Irish whiskey industry first uh, when he was trying to do his bootlegging, and they they refused to work with him. So he went to Scotland, and that kind of helped uh, Scotland keep sending their supplies out, whereas Ireland kind of got the short end of the stick on that. And uh, Prohibition didn't help either with Irish whiskey because it had such a great reputation that whenever the bootleggers were trying to pawn off their rot gut whiskey, they would throw Irish whiskey on it because they knew it could sell. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but all of this was detrimental to Irish whiskey. Yeah. So um, getting back to the world of uh, poutine, Let's talk about the ingredients, because we would say if it's the same as whiskey in many respects, you would think that they were using the same types of grains. Uh, but what's interesting is that I heard all sorts of different things that were used to distill poutine, which with moonshine yeah. in the U.S., they, they would use sugar uh, for making sugar shine, things to speed up yep. the process. So what kind of ingredients uh, would tend to find their way into poutine? Well, originally poutine, or as we would call it, fushkeb, which again later became whiskey, uh, I mean, it actually started out as imported wine, plus botanicals were being distilled. Later then, of course, uh, because of uh, various bad yields during the Middle Ages, uh, we shifted from using uh, imported wine to actually using locally uh, grown cereals because, of course, we could make beer from those, which was already being done. And so it's a grain tradition originally. And uh, the, the dominant grain would be barley, uh, followed by oats, followed by wheat, followed by rye, in that order, in that proportion. Now... Uh, distillers uh, understood the the basic principle that you had to malt you know your cereals so that you could get the enzymes in those cereals to turn starches into sugars so that was really important um, so basically most of the cereals used for poutine making as we know it would have been malted whether you're using barley oats wheat or rye they would have been malted and uh, later of course in whiskey there was the use of unmalted cereals, okay? But we can we can get to that uh, topic there uh, in, a, in a moment. But yeah, I suppose uh, cereals uh, would have been uh, the dominant one. Now, was sugar used in, in poutine? It was certainly in, in latter years, uh, but it, to, to be honest, I think it's a, it's a shortcut. And is it in the nature and tradition of poutine making? Uh, I wouldn't uh, say so uh, in the more traditional form. Did people do it? Yes. 
Uh, did it make good spirit? Yes, but uh, is it as good as uh, spirit made exclusively from grain? Uh, no. The one I actually have uh, a bit more of a, how would I put, um, more of an issue with would be the notion that uh, poutine was traditionally a potato-based spirit. And really, there's a number of reasons why potatoes are not and were not the dominant ingredient in making poutine. So, don't get me wrong, we love potatoes here. Uh, I certainly love them, and people can probably see as well uh, that I do enjoy them. Um, so what I will say about the potato, they didn't arrive in Ireland until the uh, 16th century. And uh, can I just stop for a second? Uh, sure, sure. Uh, keeping the door closed, yes, please. Um, sorry. Um, so anyway, potatoes arrived in Ireland in the uh, 16th century, whereas we've been making aquavitae since the 12th century. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think there's a gap there historically. Now, let's even leave history aside and deal with science because, uh, you know, and even intuition. So we can malt grains so that we can turn starches in the, in, in the grains into sugars. We can't, we don't have that same ability with potatoes. So if anyone was to be using potatoes, and they're well, welcome to do so, they would rely on enzymes from the likes of malt to do their conversions. Okay. And so, I've heard whey being used. I've heard sugar beets being used. Have you heard these also? Yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm very uh, sort of, uh, how would I put it, diplomatic normally, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to tell you that, uh, that whey is absolutely not under any circumstances was that used historically so uh, i won't use my french today and when i mean french <laughs> uh, I, I i mean uh, less than polite language but yes way is uh, way out of line okay uh, the other one then was there another one mentioned oh sugar beets sugar beets i mean look uh, yes uh, they were used absolutely and, and again i'm you'd see uh, there's a there's a reason why sugar beets uh, would have worked okay because of their their sugar content but again if we go back you know to the sort of uh, proper historical sort of uh, and, and and let's let's call it i mean traditions become traditions because they're carried out over a certain period of time but what i want to sort of just to be precise on this the window uh, within history in which potatoes were used was very small and the frequency of its use is very small too the same would apply with sugar beets okay so what i'm just trying to paint here is the picture that it's a very small and insignificant piece of the poutine tradition just so that we're clear i'm not dismissing them but i am dismissing way yeah. uh, for, for for a variety of reasons because <laughs> the technologies did not exist to do that okay yeah so one of the other things that i hear a lot here about moonshine is that there there's not a legal definition for moonshine and the idea that some people will say is that there really should not be a legal definition for moonshine because moonshine wasn't legal and so why would you come up with uh legal rules and and regulations but i look at uh poutine and i say you have something that is unique to ireland and that has its own tradition and so yep. where do you fall in the uh, of course you're making it and you're making it legally uh where do you fall in terms of the um creating of rules for it and trying to get uh, a, a gi um uh, designation for it so first of all yeah putin is a protected spirit it does have a gi um uh, designation so it is geographically indicated uh, must be made on the island of ireland and must follow specific rules and regulations uh, as far as it comes to, um, you know, putting making. Um, and, and again, just to give a bit of context here, uh, there is a technical committee um, which has recently been formed on the putting uh, for the putting category. And uh, no harm in mentioning as well that I was appointed the chairman of that uh, particular group. Um, but um, nonetheless, why would we have a technical file and do i agree with it i absolutely do agree with it because and you know what we don't need rules generally but the time when rules become uh, sort of required or when do they when are they needed they're needed i suppose to give boundaries uh, to those who uh, will say don't know 
where the line exists and uh, it's an unfortunate part that uh, i suppose uh, some people don't understand uh, sort of the uh, where that line is and of course some people dance very uh, sort of eloquently and and, and uh, well on that line others just miss the line completely and i think it's more for those who would miss the line completely and would go way off in terms of what was done or what was not done in putting what I would like to say, though, is that um, uh, I think it's important that there is a technical file, and there is, and this is more to give sort of a steer for people in terms of what is sort of uh, natural and traditional for putting making and still allowing a degree of innovation. So what you don't want is a technical file or rules that overly curtail how the category can evolve. Uh, it's really just to provide sort of, if you like, a funnel that we all must kind of uh, sort of, uh, you know, put our, uh, I suppose, our collective processing through. Um, so, for instance, you know, let, let me take a couple of examples out of the technical mm -hmm. file, and it, it actually makes pretty good sense. Um, so, um, are you allowed to use potatoes for making poutine? You are, but they're an adjunct ingredient. Makes sense, because historically, and from a scientific perspective, you couldn't use potatoes exclusively because the enzymes to do that weren't available so uh, from a nature and a traditional perspective it ticks that box you know and from a in the uh, how but in the essence and in the wording of it it allows innovation without sort of jumping way outside the boundaries of what uh, poutine is the other one which is quite reasonable is that botanicals are permitted and uh, these botanical infusions were practiced and uh, so what's permitted and we don't even, um, how would I put it, uh, so there's two, two uh, sort of uh, components to it. We're allowed to use uh, botanicals, provided they're either native or traditional. So that sort of allows uh, people who would have always traditionally used, uh, we would, we'll call it native botanicals, brilliant. But what if botanicals were being imported? And as, as we know, there was a strong tradition of importing and trade in Ireland with Latin Europe. So that meant that there were goods landing that weren't maybe grown in ireland but they were traditional so either it ticks the traditional box or it ticks the native box and i think that's perfectly reasonable so for instance was it traditional for you know i'm gonna like pick lemongrass out here uh, for that to be used in the flavoring of putzine uh, no is the the simple answer because it, it just wasn't being imported at the time you know or even up until recently so i think we do need sort of uh, boundaries of sorts yes it was illicit but we have to remember the reason it was illicit. It was because uh, the British authorities originally couldn't collect taxes on it. Secondly, they didn't want any competition between this domestically distilled spirit versus the commercially distilled spirit. So anyway, um, hopefully that gives a bit of insight in terms of our thoughts on it and why we think the technical file is a good thing. So talk about aging, because I, I think aging is is out, but you can actually put it into a barrel for some time. Yes, correct. So at the moment, uh, putting is permitted to um, be stored in a cask for uh, up to 10 weeks. Uh, we're not allowed to use uh, the term aged. Uh, we're not allowed to use terms such as cask or barrel. And uh, so we're actually having a, you know, a, a very uh, sort of... Uh, collegiate discussion about this at the moment within the um within the technical committee and uh th thankfully uh you know pretty much everybody there i would say uh, in fact i can actually say everybody there wants to protect the interests of of uh, irish poutine uh you know allowing innovation but keeping it within sort of some uh, sort of uh, defined boundaries um so um in terms of cask aging i mean there's the stuff like you know should we be allowed to say that this has spent time in a cask yes uh, at the moment the wording is a little bit clumsy uh, i don't think it was intentionally worded uh, sort of uh, to make it ambiguous but yeah you're only allowed to say stored in wood so for instance uh, I, th I think it would be a logical thing to be able to say that this thing has been uh, stored in a cask or in a barrel um, and, and again, should we allow uh, poutine to sort of uh, be aged for longer periods than was traditionally practiced? I would say the answer is probably no there because poutine was traditionally left in casks for short periods and uh, those, those short periods were defined by uh, each distiller. I mean, they would literally make the spirit and then shortly afterwards would sell it. But 
would they have left, for instance, let, let, let's uh, put it this way, would they have left the spirit and cask for three years? No. So it's, it's, uh, it's definitely short periods. Um, I think the, the 10 week sort of uh, window there is, is, a, is a pretty good uh, mark uh, for the moment. Uh, will that extend, you know, possibly? Uh, but everybody uh, would need to be on, on the same page or uh, we would have to reach, you know, consensus on it. So um, my thoughts is it uh, protects it. It sort of uh, puts a bit of a boundary between whiskey and poutine. Some of the wording uh, will probably change to make it uh, clearer for the consumer. So I think anything that makes it clearer for the consumer is better. Would there be any restrictions to the size of the vessel it goes into? Uh, I would say uh, that it'd be, you know, reasonable uh, that uh, because poutine distilling was illicit and from a practical perspective, the casks that they were using were generally smaller. I would say that uh, some sort of size restriction would be appropriate. So, for instance, I, I don't believe and I've never heard of it, uh, you know, from my grandfather or, or any of uh, and he had, certainly hadn't heard it from any of his uh, you know, grandfather or father or whatnot about the use of large casks for the movement of poutine. Generally speaking, they were smaller and that was, e you know, for ease of movement and hiding, etc. You know, so from a practical perspective, I think it would uh, be reasonable for them to be smaller rather than bigger. It's hard to document a legacy of something that was illicit. Uh, but, you know, when we think of different spirits and... You know, Scotland has five regions for whiskey, and those five regions had personalities. They've now started crossing the line, and you're getting peated stuff out of Speyside, and you're getting a lot of uh, sherry-finished whiskeys in Isla and that sort of thing. So there's there's a mixing of, of traditions. But in Ireland, with Poutine, was there a um, uh, were there regional differences probably that we know of? Yeah, definitely. And just in terms of, uh, I know that people might ask, uh, I mean, what do you refer to in terms of putting traditions? I mean, what are the resources that we have to sort of uh, help us define these, these boundaries? And uh, so uh, in Ireland, the oral culture was uh, highly respected. I believe it still is. Uh, obviously, the written word uh, has won, let's be honest about it, the upper hand when it comes to which which one is uh, you know more kind of recognized when it comes to law or evidence and it's the written word however a strong oral tradition existed now um thankfully a lot of the oral information was documented so now uh, it's it's actually in writing so uh, and of course you know somebody has to has to write it so we do have a, a huge depth of uh, resources there uh, that were uh, both handwritten or recorded uh, sort of uh, using various devices, uh, you know, when the oral culture was still uh, much stronger in Ireland. So those resources are, are available to us in terms of uh, what, you know, people did, of course, speak about putting. They wouldn't have uh, uh, left themselves open to getting, uh, you know, arrested or whatnot. But, <laughs> I mean, th th thankfully, those resources are available. Even my own grandfather recognized the change happening and he actually wrote a book. Uh, so there's actually material for several books which has not been published yet, but it was unusual for someone coming from the oral tradition to, to write a book. But thankfully, uh, there was a lot of people who encouraged him. Uh, so humility uh, would have been a strong trait of that generation. So anyway, sorry, coming back here to the uh, sort of uh, the, the question that was actually asked. And... Um, <laughs> Uh, the, the, the question was, just remind me again of the, where, where we were going the, on the... Uh, the region. So, like, if we talk about um, your, now, your yes. grandfather, were we uh, would he have called what he was making a uh, Connemara style? Um, it was implicit that it was Connemara style. So, I suppose throughout the country, uh, I mean, the early putting and even early whiskey traditions, because coal was not being imported until, I guess, industrialization became a thing, uh, sort of, you know, in, in, in uh, England and whatnot. Uh, so I suppose anthracite coal was being imported when it became cheaper to do so than using locally sourced turf. So the local turf was a factor there in terms of uh, where did the peat come from? So peat would have certainly been a, a, a stronger 
uh, sort of thing there in in. Uh... Sorry, no. It's alright. So, uh, sorry, the peace influence. Now, peace influence there uh, would have been a huge kind of uh, differentiating factor. Uh, for us here in, in Galway and Connemara, the peace would have been sort of uh, sweet and earthen, uh, rather than, uh, I suppose, what uh, people would associate maybe with uh, some Isla whiskies off the west coast of Scotland, which uh, some of them are kind of more medicinal, more briny, so that would be sort of uh, one of the things. Now, regionality also came in the form of uh, which cereal types were used. Now, nationwide, we can sort of say that barley was the king of cereals in making whiskey. Now, regionality came into it then with the adjunct cereals, your uh, oats, wheat and rye. Okay, so oats was really prevalent around Connacht. And the reason for that was our soils in, in Connacht, uh, just not, not uh, putting it all under the one category, but by and large, the, the, the soils wouldn't have been as fertile, we'll say, or as productive, we'll say, as soils in the south and east. So oats was a stronger cereal, uh, you know, a more prevalent cereal type there in that region. So um, that's one thing to note, that uh, Connacht-based spirits would have contained higher proportions of oats. Um, now, that's not to say that oats weren't used in other regions, but there was a valid reason why oats were more prevalent. Uh, rye was uh, traditionally grown in areas all along the west coast and in other areas, but uh, rye would have been quite resilient uh, to sort of salt air, to more acidic soils, um, so that was also widely grown. Um, now, the barley was quite resilient as well, but it did require uh, a more fertile soil than the likes of uh, rye or oats. And then uh, wheat, so for instance, wheat wouldn't have been as widely grown in the West as it would have been grown in the East mm. because it was uh, quite a demanding crop on soils. So you'll find more use of uh, wheat in the likes of the South and East than you would have along the West Coast for, for the uh, sort of uh, the basic reason of uh, soil types and fertility and productivity. And it goes back to you use what you have available on hand. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, also, just a trend uh, or a sort of a, a geographical thing, um, the regionality. So just to be brutally honest, uh, poutine making would have taken place more. The further west you go and the further north you go, the more prevalent it was because uh, these were the sort of more sparsely uh, populated regions and also had more remote locations which was perfect for distilling illicitly uh, I, I would suggest that the closer you got to uh, the uk and to the sort of uh, the commercial centers of, of ireland so the, the bigger cities the closer you were to uh, the law and uh, basically the further away you got from the cities or from sort of uh, let, let's call it uh, uh, greater densities of population the the uh, the closer you were to the to the law so for, from from that perspective uh, yeah more of a west and northern irish product rather than a south and eastern uh, sort of tradition now of course you have pockets like west cork but that's quite remote as well you see it's, it's uh, kept away from the likes of cork city um, and uh, up to connemara which is close to galway city but remote in the grand scheme of things you know yeah it's amazing to me, maybe not so much because I grew up in the mountains of North Carolina. So we heard, you know, if you needed moonshine, you could you could find somebody who could get you some some moonshine. And it's fun to drive around Ireland, talk to distillers and hear them also say, yeah, I, I mean, I know people I could go to if I needed to go get some uh, uh, some, some patine because it's it's everywhere uh, still yes. to this day. So. When you were talking with your your grandfather, did he have uh, did he have stories of, of uh, some some crazy situations maybe that he got into or that he heard from other people uh, in in the uh, world of illicit distilling? Uh, plenty. Uh, so I think one of the most uh, unusual. Well, I'll tell you kind of maybe two stories. Uh, one of them involved Mikkel himself. 
So Mikkel would have uh, is still widely regarded in uh, local folklore, and uh, on one occasion uh, he was raided um, in his uh, in his home by uh, three uh, RIC constables. So this was before the establishment of the Republic of Ireland. So we were still under British rule. But anyway, uh, they raided his house. They found nothing. And then literally there was no other houses really uh, within, I would say, two, three miles of Mikkel's home. And the f uh, if you went north of that house, there was nothing like for, I'd say, uh, 12 miles in a, in, a, in a complete circle. So quite a vast open sort of area. And uh, a lot of this area would have been commonage. So commonage meaning you had uh, several shareholders and, and most of this land would have been used for uh, the grazing of cattle and sheep. Uh, but it was perfect for distilling poutine as well because if your still was confiscated, uh, there was legal ambiguity over ownership because the plot of land would have been owned collectively by the shareholders. So nobody could claim, you know, that's my piece and that's your piece because it was all collectively owned. Now, anyway, these three RIC constables went looking for stills and, uh, you know, it doesn't really happen today, but one of them, he became suddenly quite ill. And what happened to him, you see, was he, um, he, there's this condition which is called Shliav uh, Gortoch or Fodin Mara. And uh, in the absence of a, a precise translation, it's essentially uh, both of them would uh, be sort of, uh, how would I put it, disorientation out of malnutrition mm -hmm. or uh, sort of uh, 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 that, that type of thing. But anyway, one of them got quite suddenly sick and weak and he collapsed. And uh, the other two constables then were waiting for him, hoping he would uh, sort of recover. And, uh, you know, they tried water with him and whatnot. It didn't work. So they then went to get some help because they, they didn't really know what the cure was. So they went to Mikkel's house, which was the nearest house. And uh, they didn't intentionally go for his house, but it was the closest one. Uh, it was getting dark at this point as well. And um, basically, they explained to Mikkel what had happened, and uh, he actually very kindly uh, gave them the cure for it, which was simply uh, what we probably call today like porridge or uh, that or either milled corn. So uh, in the Irish language called min wee, which is literally uh, a fine, uh, it's, like, it's almost like a flour, but a coarser flour uh, made out of cereal. And uh, what you would do is you'd wet it. So he said to them, okay, this is the cure for, for his ailment. Uh, what you need to do is wet it before you feed, feed it to him. And he also explicitly said, uh, if you don't wet it, there is a risk of suffocation. So the two constables took off with the cure and uh, they, uh, they found their, their third constable, again, still in the same place, uh, hadn't done uh, much kind of gains and they fed him the, uh, the milled cereal, but they forgot to wet it so a bad story turned into a worse story oh. they accidentally uh choked the guy uh because he he just uh, suffocated basically on the corn so anyway they had to try and carry him in in the dark of night uh, back to a safe place uh, for them to spend the night but uh, they were unused to the the terrain uh, at day or at night so they were kind of falling into bog holes and whatnot and they decided for their own safety to leave the body and to make their own way to safety and uh, basically they landed back once more to Mikkel's house and this in the middle of the night and he knew that something disastrous had happened they explained what had happened and he said where's the body and they said we had to abandon the body and he said well uh, he said well we can't leave the body out there so what he did was he he asked them and they went with them uh, he asked them to describe as best as they could the location. So anyway, he went off with them and they figured out where the, the man was. Um, and uh, he, Mikkel, carried back the uh, the dead policeman himself. Mm -hmm. And that night they had a wake in Mikkel's house. And uh, so the next morning, uh, the next day rather, the district inspector, uh, the superior officer, came to his house and he thanked him for looking after his uh, constables uh, despite the what he called it, the, the previous visit that day. And he said, look, um, we've been trying to sort of catch you and the likes of you, uh, but we've never been successful. But now he said, we don't intend on being successful in catching you, <laughs> making your spirit. And uh, he said, basically, uh, 
why don't you uh, not worry about us anymore? Um, wow. And and basically in in a in a very sort of uh, how to put it, uh, uh, you know, implicit way, was said basically keep making your putts in. Don't worry <laughs> about us anymore. Nice. Oh, so, so that was the end of of the raids for Mikkel. Wow, it's good to do a good deed here or there. There you go. There you go. Yes. Moral of the story. What was what was the other story? <laughs> the other story was in 1974. There was a famous local raid. And it happened, uh, of course, in a place called Invrin, which is where we're from. Now, allegedly, um, when the still was confiscated, uh, the police didn't know who it belonged to. Again, uh, because it was found on Commonage, that land that has multiple shareholders. So then um, that night when the still and the product had been locked up in the local police barracks, allegedly the local distiller or distillers decided to recover their equipment by breaking into the station. Uh, so there was a break-in at the station. The still was taken back. Product was taken back. And uh, the next morning, there was a huge investigation launched uh, about the crime. Uh, the still was never recovered, and the culprits were never brought to justice. And it became a huge news headline, and uh, everybody was sort of uh, interrogated about the events of the evening. But uh, uh, I um, I guess I'm saying as kind of as much as I can, uh, but uh, anyway, or as much as I know. Sorry, wrong turn of phrase, right? Yeah. Uh, but um, I suppose uh, some of the headlines of the time would have read like um, uh, there was one of them that was one of the, in, in one of the national papers. It was uh, raid in reverse was the headline, mm. <laughs> and one of the other ones then was uh, Connemara putting distillers cheekier than ever, but uh, you know. We have an old still in our uh, distillery and, uh, you know, all the stills back then would have looked quite similar. But uh, some people would kind of joke and they'd say, is that it? You know, <laughs> and, uh, obviously, you know, it could very, very well be it. But of course, I'm sure it's not. Yeah. So were you surprised, shifting gears here, that uh, distilling had not uh, occurred legally in Galway for a hundred years when you guys decided to jump in and start distilling there very surprised and uh, you know I, I always had a great passion for all things uh, traditional to our culture and uh, I always knew I'd be doing either something that involved our language or something to do with uh, one of our traditions and uh, putting was just such a big part of our family story it just uh, begged I suppose to be continued but continued i suppose evolving into the legitimate sphere so one day i was actually reading about tequila and there was so many parallels the parallels of uh, people used to think uh, that uh, tequila is you know coarse and uh, that it was illegal and people were misinformed about what it was made from i mean people used to think that tequila was made from cactus and i was like <laughs> there's a strange amount of similarities here you know between poutine and tequila yes we don't make our poutine from agave but people think it's made from potatoes you know so uh, i thought we have a great story uh, i know that we make a fantastic spirit uh, but we're not doing it legitimately so why shouldn't we why wouldn't we yeah and there you go so uh, uh was galway really the place that you uh, felt like was the perfect place to to go to to do this I mean, originally I wanted to start the distillery in Connemara, but, uh, you know, basically I found out the hard way that uh, planning regulations are quite challenging here in Ireland, uh, especially if you want to do something a bit out of the ordinary. But um, so uh, I applied uh, for planning permission to build, well, not even build, to uh, change the purpose of a, of a farm building that we had on the family farm. But long story short, spent a ton of money and uh, we ended up getting refused permission by the National Planning Authority. Uh, so the local council actually did give us permission, but then there's a window where um, people who are, um, you know, permitted to make, uh, uh, how would I put it, legal objections to it. So that that did happen. Uh, so anyway, that uh, led us down the path. And that's the, I suppose, the beauty and the the, the sort of uh, the, the, the bad side as well to uh, entrepreneurship or, or business ownership 
it's never straightforward but you do have to be resilient you have to be resourceful like the poutine distillers so we went for plan b and plan c so plan b was to um find a place that we could distill in which was already zoned appropriately or had a brewery in it so we actually found this place here in salt hill which used to be the galway bay brewery so the guys uh, who founded Galway Bay Brewery had already built or uh, founded, uh, you know, at the next extension of their brewery. Uh, they were going through massive expansions, and uh, they said, "Our old brewery is now idle, uh, but we'd love to see it, you know, full of life again." So that's where we landed. Nice and uh, unique way to get into your distillery because you have to go through a pub. You do, and <laughs> people are almost like, "Is it still illegal?" And it's like, "No, it just." <laughs> means that we have to go through a bar um so uh so yeah it kind of adds a bit of intrigue to it it almost kind of adds to the to the story that you do have to go through the oslo bar so it does occasionally get people kind of a bit confused yeah where are you you know and all this kind of has, stuff you know? has a whole so, speakeasy kind of a feel to it it does it does, <laughs> it does indeed, yeah. <laughs> so was uh poutine really your first uh, thought in doing the distillery or were you ultimately really looking to make whiskey as well? Ultimately, I consider poutine and whiskey uh, to sort of be the same thing uh, historically. Obviously, whiskey has to be aged in a wooden cask. Um, so for me, when I was setting out to make uh, poutine, um, it was always going to be a natural progression that we would age you know, new make spirit. And just to be clear, I don't consider uh, poutine and new make to be exactly the same, of course, uh, because uh, whiskey is going into a cask, whereas poutine doesn't have to. And, and poutine is going to be consumed either unaged or left in a cask for a very short space of time. So I, uh, just on that piece. Uh, but um, no, it was always the intention that we would lay down whiskey in the parliament whiskey sense. Uh, as well as making poutine. But uh, as many people have told us since, you certainly went about it the hard way, starting with poutine, <laughs> the one that people did not understand, recognize, or respect. And, uh, you know, I'm glad for it because actually people uh, admired that and they still remember us as being the sort of the poutine distillery. So while we're making whiskey and gin and uh, Irish cream liqueur, and uh, thankfully we're, we're winning awards and uh, doing very well, uh, people still, you know, recognize us uh, as that poutine distillery. So um, anybody else, I think, you know, sort of uh, jumping into that sort of space. Um, yes, I mean, they're, they're sort of, uh, I mean, they're doing great job for the category. But uh, I think uh, people will still remember us as the as the poutine distillers. Yeah, trailblazers. Trailblazers, yes. yeah, in a way, in a way. But uh, the trailblazing was done by the former generations, to be fair. Yeah. So... When did you actually put your first whiskey in a barrel or your first new make into a barrel, I should say, officially? Yeah. Uh, if I'm not mistaken on the exact date, I believe it was Thanksgiving 2020. Okay. So you got a little while before it uh, hits that official mark. We do, we do. But we'll certainly announce when we have whiskey that we've laid down that hits three years old. So we, we can't wait but, you know, time flies. It's not that far away. Yeah. Just another one year plus, you know, and uh, we're already at the end of June, scarily. And it's it's fascinating to drive across Ireland and have the opportunity to see how many distilleries are really in that same position. They, they are using sourced whiskey now because they have to Uh, Because they want to have a product out to be able to make some money off of before they actually have their own spirit. And some want to wait for three years to release and and just release it as soon as it comes out. Others are saying, no, we definitely want to go to five years or or longer to release our whiskeys. You've got a product already out. You've got several products already out. Did you ever uh, think of going the sourced route? Uh, we have gone the sourced route. Um, now, uh, just just briefly, we started with the classic Michael Irish poutine. Uh, we brought out a gin then, and the reason we did the gin was because uh, it contains uh, a wildflower, well, several wildflowers and herbs, actually. But our poutine always had this bog bean botanical in it. So, uh, you know, gin was sort of, a, if you like, a natural progression for us as well because it's a botanically favoured spirit. 
So we said, why don't we um, create a gin that encapsulates Connemara? So we did that. It's been a very successful product for us. Um, and then we did the Heritage Putty in the peated version. Now, we always, as I said, envisioned laying down whiskey and having our own whiskies. And uh, we always said, before we release any independent uh, bottling, uh, as in sourced whiskey, that we would have started laying down our own whiskey first. Mm so that people recognize that uh, our, where our intentions were and uh, that, 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 is, uh, that was our intention. So we have two independent whiskey bottlings on the market at the moment, one that encapsulates the Connemara tradition and one that encapsulates the Galway City tradition. So we're, uh, we're really happy, I suppose, that we have two great tr traditions to draw from, uh, which are distinct, but also have a bit of overlap. So in Connemara, we had peated tradition and we had small cast traditions because the poutine distillers, uh, for obvious reasons, had to have smaller casks. In Galway City, we have the Latin European tradition where they were, uh, you know, importing uh, huge amounts of wine and fortified wine and spirits into Galway. And, of course, that gave the local distilleries then this wealth of used casks that they could reuse. So it added a tremendous amount of colour and sort of uh, Latin European culture into the whiskies that we were making. So... And, and also there's actually a small cast tradition in Galway City as well. So these uh, quarter uh, quarter barrels, we call them. So they're 50 litre casks. And funny enough, actually, we have a cask ownership offering. So people can actually buy one of these casks from us if they wanted to. And uh, it's very much sort of uh, echoing what was done both in Connemara and in Galway City. So it's a, it's a nice way for people to get into Galway or Connemara whiskey while joining us on the on the journey. It's interesting that you bring up, because we really didn't talk about this in terms of the history of, of Galway, but uh, I, I sort of referenced it when you were describing it to me while I was there as it was kind of like the Liverpool of or Campbelltown of Ireland, that there was a lot of shipping that came in, and there's a really heavy influence of uh, the, the Latin tradition uh, from Europe that's in that area, including names that you will see uh, that kind of traded back and forth. Yeah, totally. So, for instance, one of the, the like Galway City is known as the City of Tribes, and uh, uh, Burke is one of the surnames there. Uh, now, that originally came from France, uh, de Burgo, right? Mm -hmm. So, that's one of the actual tribes' names. So, that gives you a little picture. I'll just give several examples here that kind of uh, concisely kind of give us an indication as to the sort of trading history between Galway and Latin Europe. So that's the French influence. And then you look at the likes of uh, sort of um, Madeira Island, okay, which is an island within Galway city centre, only separated by uh, canals and the river. And then you have uh, Spanish Parade. You also have Spanish Arch. And even the genetics, I mean, there was a fascinating documentary done uh, a number of years ago about uh, the Spanish influence here in Galway and Connemara. And it was... Um, absolutely how to put it uh really kind of interesting and and, and uh, uh yeah about the, the the amount of spanish influence in in the local genetics so that's that's really fascinating there now you travel to bordeaux and you look at some of the the names within some of the chateaus and you go to uh, for instance uh, chateau lynch badge so lynch happens to be one of the old uh, galway uh, tribe surnames or second names so that's where that comes from. Mm. So a lot of Irish uh, elite certainly would have, uh, they would have uh, emigrated or fled Ireland with the invasion of the British and they found refuge, I guess, in wineries or distilleries. So even one of the biggest uh, global cognac brands is called Hennessy and Hennessy is, is Irish there. So huge amounts of uh, traditions, both in Latin Europe and in Galway or Ireland of uh, the back and forth trade. It's fun to trace all of this and and see those influences and and how culture may have changed due to those uh being a shipping port like that and then to see a name like madeira it's like that is a very unique name to an island that is near portugal that has its own history uh in yes. terms of spirit so it's 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 just fascinating to uh to see that and i would not have thought of that with uh with Galway being an an outsider but it, it only makes sense it's on the uh it's facing the Atlantic so it's it's got it easy is. shipping lanes to get out 
It does, it does, it does, yeah. Also, uh, remarkably good uh, for the smuggling of goods, given that the coastline is very long. <laughs> true, <laughs> very true. So um, let's talk about the styles that you are making in terms of whiskey. Of course, um, uh, people familiar with my show have been hearing a little bit more about the pot still style of, of whiskey. And so we got a general idea on that. But what's interesting is you are making a pot still and a heritage pot still. So when you call it heritage right. pot still, what, uh, what are you meaning by that? So the current, so we, we spoke earlier about the technical file for poutine. There's also a technical file then that uh, defines what Irish whiskey is and the different styles within that. So you got single malt, single pot still, grain whiskey and blend. And there's various rules and regulations around what each one is and how they can be made, etc. And how they can be labeled. But um, in the 18th century, the Irish got hit with the malt tax as if we didn't have enough <laughs> taxes. And the distilleries then recognized that there was a way around this. So this would be tax avoidance as opposed to tax evasion. And avoidance is a legal way of uh, not incurring uh, taxes. So anyway, uh, they started using unmalted barley as well as the malted barley. And they also used other cereals that were unmalted purely to avoid taxes. And in the process, they did avoid taxes, but they also created a new style of whiskey, which back then was known as pure pot still now for a variety of reasons the word pure is no longer permitted uh, on, uh, to be written on the bottles but if you do see some of the old whiskey mirrors you'll see the word pure pots the, the terminology pure pot still on those today it's called single pot still now the modern equivalent of uh, this is called single pot still and currently and i'll say currently for a good reason five percent other cereals may be used the minimum proportions of uh, barley is 35% and you must use a minimum of 35% malt. And of course, those familiar with bourbon, obviously they're familiar with, you know, if you're making bourbon and correct me if I'm wrong here, Drew, but 51% uh, corn right. must be used in the mash bill for, for, for bourbon making. So we have similar rules around how you make a single pot still style. Now, historically, was the 5% other cereals uh, a true reflection? No, and uh, for that reason, there's been a mature dialogue between all stakeholders in the industry. Thankfully, we have lots of historical documents to show uh, the historical precedents for using uh, a much greater proportion of other cereals. So all members of the Irish Whiskey Association and uh, stakeholders of the industry have agreed amongst themselves uh, that 35% other cereals should be permitted. And uh, we have... A, we have consensus amongst the members, and B, we have the historical uh, evidence to show that this was true. And uh, ultimately, the next uh, sort of body that needs to make a decision on this is the Department of Agriculture, and they hold the, uh, if you want to call it, the keys to un unlocking uh, this uh, amendment. But I'd be very confident that this amendment will, will go through. So that's the reason for us having the Heritage uh, Mash Bill. Is it recognised today as a... Um, as a pot still, uh, legally we can't put single pot still on that bottle. That's why we have um, the, the the current version, which is a single pot still, and then the other one then is uh, I'll, I'll basically tell you what the proportions are. It's forty percent malt, thirty five percent unmalted barley, twelve percent oats, eight percent wheat, and five percent rye, and each cereal giving its own texture, flavor, and aroma. Very nice. So the hope is that since you have some time for this to continue aging, that uh, by the time you're ready to release it, hopefully you'll be able to call it what you need to call it. <laughs> it, it, it you know, for us, it's kind of a bonus if we're allowed to call it a uh, single pot steel. The, the cask customers who bought these casks, uh, I mean, for them, they're not like worried or, you know, they don't even uh, particularly care whether this becomes like a single pot still. What they're what they care about is that it's uh, unique and uh, that it's historically relevant. And that's the reason why most people have gone for that particular mash bill. Uh, obviously, there's a single malt in the uh, in the equation, which is peated. And that's one thing that makes us really different here in Ireland, because a lot of the Irish whiskey at the moment that is being laid down is unpeated. Uh, we, we'll take it a step further because we're actually using our own peat that we still cut in Connemara on our own family bog that has been cut for, for generations. Mm. So it's, it's amazing to keep that part of the tradition going. I actually literally heard this a couple of times from 
Irish distillers uh, who a, a couple of them said just in casual conversation, um, I would say, uh, would you consider doing a peated version? And they would go, oh, that's Scotland, you know? And I, and I thought, oh. <laughs> there's, there's a real need to get the history out there and to help people understand it that it's not, uh, it's not a, a given that even in Scotland that they're going to use peat, that, you know, peat, no, it's not. peat was a, uh, uh, that before coal was easily transported around, uh, peat was it. You, what else were you going to use? Exactly. And it's interesting uh, that uh, some Irish distillers would have said that. So I don't know if you refer to the company or whether you're referring to just Irish distillers. But, uh, you know, we, we some sometimes we can be uh, a bit uh, ignorant of our own history, but that is the, the history. So, yeah, of course, not all Scotch whiskey is peated. That's that's one piece of uh, sort of, uh, of information. And the other thing is not all Irish is unpeated. Right. Absolutely. And uh, and not all of it's triple distilled. Um, no, it's not all triple distilled. Yeah. I mean, that there's uh, there are these things that I think people are going to learn over time. And I think that's the 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 question. You know, when I talked to John Teeling, he said that. Um, uh, you know, I asked him point blank because I've heard this from a lot of people that there will be a point when Irish whiskey passes by Scotch whiskey in popularity. And his reasoning for saying that he believes that to be true and maybe something that will happen within the next five years or so is that sort of where Ireland was or where where Ireland and Scotland were back in the 1800s, where Ireland said we're sticking tr to tradition and you had Scotland saying, we are going to uh, innovate, that we're in the reverse now, that Ireland yes. is saying, hey, you know what, we're ready to innovate, and Scotland is saying, y you know what, we are Scotch, and we are the best product out there. So, you know, we're not worried. It, it, do you feel that? History, history repeats itself. Yeah, in reverse, exactly. Learn from history, it's right? In reverse. Yeah, it's that's uh, I I love that uh, line of thought, and I, I I would tend to agree with this. I mean, even in Irish whiskey, we're allowed to use uh, woods that aren't oak, because the technical file states that the whiskey must be aged in a wooden cask. It doesn't specify oak, so we can use chestnut, cherry, acacia. So look, it's it's just leaves that bit of innovation. I mean, most Irish whiskey is still aged in in oak without a shadow of a doubt, both new make, both new oak and, and uh, seasoned oak. Yeah. Know? So where do you see, uh, where do you see the Irish whiskey industry going? Do you see this uh, innovation continuing? And how do you feel like this switch from all of these distilleries using whiskey from Great Northern and from, uh, from West Cork and all of these other uh, sources and then trying to ease their uh, their stocks in do you uh, and 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 sort of your own evolution on that as well uh, you know how do you think it's uh, going to shift do you think that there'll be kind of a a, a period where Irish whiskey will have to kind of um, stumble through maybe where the quality drops a little bit and then comes back up again or uh, yeah um i mean but yeah there's a there's a good bit to that uh but uh my my general thing well my, my hope my hope would be that uh all the distilleries that are now laying down their whiskey i i really hope and i haven't tasted you see a lot of uh new makes from from irish distilleries but my hope is that they're laying down a uh, good quality spirit in in good wood uh because uh it's it's very important to uh, everyone within this industry that we make good whiskey so um I, i'd be hopeful that people are doing that uh there will definitely be a transition whether it's a smooth one or a rocky one i don't know people going from uh, independent bottling to their own whiskies uh but i mean those who've done the transition have done so successfully as far as i can see and uh you know i'd be very confident that we'll uh, make that transition uh, successfully and smoothly as well yeah. uh you know the, the whiskey that we're laying down ourselves is uh, quite distinct from what we're able to make in terms of uh, or do with with the uh, independent uh, independently sourced whiskey um so um 
I actually genuinely believe, I suppose, that uh, you know that it won't be smooth for everyone. Uh, just being candid about it, uh, but uh, I, I, I do think for the most part that uh, we will represent Irish whiskey very well. I, I have to tell you this because uh, I haven't I haven't told you this to this point, but uh, there was something that happened when I was at your distillery. I tend to take little mini bottles with me when I go into distilleries, <laughs> so that uh, in case when I'm doing a tasting of something, you know, I'm driving a lot, so I don't want to be drinking and driving. So I know. so I'll do my little sample. So I poured some. Uh, some of the sample into a little Bushmills. I had gotten it at Bushmills, a little mini Bushmills bottle. And uh, when I got towards the end of my trip and I was in Dublin and I was looking at all these mini bottles I had, I I had one night where I said, okay, I'm just going to go through and I'm going to taste these and I'm going to do tasting notes on them. And then, uh, you know, and every single one of them was marked except for this Bushmills one. It didn't have anything written on it. And I went and i sipped on it and i went wow this stuff is really good i was writing down all these different notes and i'm like and i i hate it because i don't know where i got it from but when i went <laughs> back and i looked through my notes i had written that while i was at mickle i had put some whiskey into a uh into a bushmills bottle so that was uh I remember that, by the that way. That was your spirit. And I'm like, wow, this stuff yeah. is really, really good because I enjoyed it while I was there. But the hard part about being on site with somebody and doing a tasting is that your your attention is in multiple places. Oh, stop. You're, you're talking to somebody. You're trying to think, okay, I got to, you know, when when am I leaving here? And, you know, all these little things are uh, going through your mind at the end of a, a visit. And so, uh, uh, so I, I sort of had my attention on it while I was there. But... Uh, it was great when I got to taste that, and then just that light bulb moment that, oh yeah, that is where I I got that from. It was, Brilliant. Well, I'm delighted that you found it so good. Yes, it was, uh, and it was in the uh, small barrels, the quarter casks. That's that right. You're using. Yeah. So literally, what, we we have uh, four little casks in our cask owner's office, and uh, when people come to uh, select a cask from us. Uh, we use those maybe as a as a tool to help them sort of appreciate well this new make can go this direction this new make can go that direction this is how x bourbon influences this this is how px influences that and uh, it's just a nice little tool for people to gain an understanding i think a lot of distilleries wouldn't necessarily be um you know um confident or you know some of them might be afraid of giving customers samples of new make because it is an aggressive spirit and it's not representative of how it's going to be at the end but uh, i i think it's great for them to see what is the blank canvas like and what does the cast then do to that uh, blank canvas yeah so where is uh mickle available at this point is it mostly in europe is it in ireland is it uh, is there ever a chance it's coming to the united states or is it in the united states it's not in the United States at the moment, uh, unfortunately. However, we are working diligently towards that. Um, so within the European Union, uh, pretty much anybody can order online uh, from our website. Um, so, so that would be kind of the two options. But Ireland, we are widely uh, distributed. Uh, we have a bit of distribution now in the UK. Uh, we have some distribution in Germany as well. And uh, I suppose anyone in the German market there, they can order online through irishwhiskies.de. Uh, but otherwise, um, I suppose some people are managing to find to get some of our stock shipped, uh, not directly from our website to the US, but uh, they might try the likes of irishmalls.com. So that's that's an option. Uh, sometimes they, they do that. Uh, I don't know if they do it all the time, but anyway, it's worth a shot. But uh, my suggestion is to... Uh, follow us on social media and we will be or even you know sign up to our newsletter we will inform people of when we're going stateside and uh, the sooner the better uh, for us yeah and are you back doing tours again oh we're flat out doing tours at the moment yeah so we're one of the busiest uh, visitor attractions here in Galway uh, there's uh, I mean Galway is just this fantastic destination of uh, 
you know, with all the great restaurants and bars and the scenery, it's on the doorstep of Connemara. But we're one of those indoor attractions. There aren't a huge amount. But uh, if people are visiting Galway City, uh, we certainly say, look, put us on your itinerary. Make sure you book in advance because it does get really busy. Uh, you know, if you if you turn up and there's a there's a tour on, you know, obviously it'll be hard to sort of uh, accommodate. But we'll we'll do our best. Yeah. But the best thing is to go to our website in advance. Well, Pork, I really appreciate you taking the time today and and talking through. We learned a lot about uh, poutine. I'm gonna work on my pronunciation. Uh, and uh, this is, this is my whole journey now. We'll be trying to educate people on different pronunciations for Irish things now because I did a video series <laughs> on uh, on Scotch pronunciation. So uh, now we have to get some of these uh, very interesting Irish language uh, terms that are. Uh, you know defined for people so we're not butchering the language well if you ever need a follow-up kind of really short podcast on irish language words or anything uh feel free to to, to ask fantastic fantastic pork thank you so much for your time i appreciate thanks you. a million uh, really appreciate you having me on drew uh much appreciate really enjoyed the conversation and uh, hopefully your listeners will enjoy it as much as we have <laughs>